Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. The nuclear, uh, national, the nuclear Security Summit, the fourth in a series begun by the Obama administration, recently complete, concluded here in Washington and saw over 50 countries uh, participate in discussions on nuclear proliferation and terrorism. Joining me with an analysis of the summit is Joseph Cerincioni. He's president of the Plowshares Fund, formerly served on the staff of the House Armed Services Committee and as vice president for national security at the Center for American Progress and as director for nonproliferation at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's author of three books on nuclear weapons issues, and his latest is Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Joe. I want to start, if we could, not on the summit, but actually on the Iran deal. Uh -huh. We are um, uh, a year into the, the preliminary agreement that was uh, initialed before we got to the final, yes. uh, the final deal. Uh, but I want to look back at it because it is an issue in this presidential campaign yes. uh, being hotly debated by the, 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 the Republicans in particular. The question is, what did it do and is it working? Yeah, well, this many people <coughs> call this the most dramatic uh, diplomatic achievement of a generation or more. And it's certainly, it's certainly the high watermark of President Obama's nuclear policy that he came into office promising to deliver on. He's done many things in his term, but this, the Iran deal, is by far the, the most significant. It enjoys the support of the broad consensus of nuclear policy experts. In fact, I only know one or two nuclear policy experts who actually came out against the deal. It enjoys the support of, of military leaders, national intelligence leaders, because it does two very important things. It stops Iran from getting a bomb, period, full stop. Under this deal, they will not get a bomb for at least 15 or 20 years, and perhaps permanently. And number two, it prevents a new war in the Middle East. You may remember five years ago when President Obama started this diplomatic effort, all the talk in Washington was when we were going to go to war with Iran, not if, whether it was going to be us or the Israelis. The pressure was on, the push was on. This deal stopped that war. It takes Iran's program and it shrinks it to a small fraction of what it has been. It locks it up in the most intrusive inspection regime ever negotiated for an agreement of this type, puts a camera on it and, and makes sure that, that the United States does not have to worry about a nuclear weapon from Iran for at least two decades, nor do the regional uh, powers surrounding Iran. Is it working? It, what has been done to date? Every indication <coughs> is that it's working perfectly. Iran has, has fulfilled everything asked of them. They've ripped out two-thirds of their centrifuges. They've shipped out uh, almost all their uranium gas, the material you would put in the centrifuges. They pulled out the core of their plutonium production reactor, drilled it full of holes, and filled it with concrete. The inspectors are in. The cameras are in. The, the, the seals and verification mechanisms are in. Um, they have done everything asked of them, and so have we. In exchange for them doing that, we pulled the sanctions. We lifted the sanctions that had isolated Iran and cut them off from the uh, international uh, financial and commercial systems. Um, there's a little bit of a problem on our end. If there's any problem in the agreement, it's on our end. The banks are somewhat <coughs> reluctant to go invest in Iran again the way they're now allowed to do because they're not sure that they're not going to get tagged again for violations of sanctions. So the U.S. is being asked to give those banks a little more assurance, and I think that'll be forthcoming in the coming weeks. But there still are sanctions that the U.S. has on Iran that are related to its engagement in terrorism and support for terrorist entities. Oh, sure. So How this do you was separate just, out the two? Well, there, there's different laws, different resolutions on different kinds of sanctions. So this is just about the nuclear deal. We still object to their testing of long-range missiles. The but UN on the has terrorism sanctions. ones, uh, and, don't the banks, aren't the banks brought into that one too? The terrorism ones are very narrow. So there's okay. certain entities that okay. we sanction. Okay. But it's not, it's the, the nuclear sanction, the, uh, sanctions cut off Iran's banking system from electronic transfers. That crippled 
the banking system. That's lifted, that's gone. There's still individual more focused sanctions related to ballistic missiles, terrorism, and human rights. In fact, we've added a few more since the deal was um, went into effect. Let me, let me ask you some of the questions that the critics raised. The first one, obviously, I think you've dealt with to some degree, but, but if you would anyway, it is that the sanctions, that the, that the, the, the restraints imposed by the deal or the, the, the surveillance mm -hmm. mechanisms aren't going to be effective, that Iran can cheat or, in any case, just wait it out um, and you'll see a bomb in 15 years or 20 years. So uh, almost every <coughs> objective observer who's looked at this thinks that, including the Israelis, yeah. including the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission, who said there's a, that, that this would almost certainly catch Iran should they try to cheat. And the reason is, while it might be possible for Iran to evade one particular constraint, for example, secretly building um, a, a site where they might assemble centrifuges, it's very hard for them to evade the five, six, seven layers of this, where we control the materials that they're getting, where we're tracking the uranium from the time it, it leaves the mine, where we're tracking all the scientists, where we have a special procurement channel set up, so anything they want to buy from the outside world related to this has to go through that channel. There's, there's, it's this multiplicity that makes it very hard for them to cheat. Can they wait it out? Well, you know, the answer is yes. In 25 years, if Iran wanted to build a bomb, they probably could. The sanctions would be completely lifted. The restrictions on their numbers of centrifuges would be lifted. But you know what? That's true of South Korea. That's true of Japan. That's true of numerous countries that have the capability to build weapons, but have now have promised not to and agreed to these kinds of inspections. A lot depends on what, do, what we do in the interim. What, what does our relationship with Iran look like 15, 20 years from now? What does the Middle East look like? What does the international global regime look like? Can we take the incredible inspection regime that we put on Iran and apply it to everybody? Can we put the restrictions that they can't enrich more than 3.97% of uranium and put it on everybody? Can we make it in other ways, can we globalize the Iran deal so everybody has to live by these standards? Another criticism is that it expended significant diplomatic pressure and, um, and economic pressure um, to remove a threat that didn't yet exist mm -hmm. while ignoring the threat that Iran continues to pose in very real ways by its behavior in, in the region. In other words, that there was mm -hmm. a bit of misdirection here. We were going maybe after the wrong target. Well, this is a criticism <laughs> the neoconservatives pose, and that's one of the reasons you saw the neoconservatives and the, the prime minister of Israel opposed to this deal. It really wasn't about the substance of the deal. They didn't want any agreement with Iran. They didn't want to legitimize this regime. They wanted to overthrow this regime, and that's continuing the failed policies that got us involved in the but war the, in Iraq. It's also, it's also uh, an Arab concern, a uh, Gulf concern, in that uh, they see a real threat from and you Iran could, in Iraq, and you, in Syria, in Yemen, and they feel yeah. that this frees Iran now to pursue its regional agenda. Well, there's a kernel of truth to that. <clears throat> and this deal was never about changing Iran's regional behavior, changing their domestic policy, changing their support for Hezbollah and Hamas, changing their relations with Saudi Arabia. It, it didn't fix any of those things. It's not a cure for cancer. It's not going to help you shed those unwanted pounds. It does only one thing. It stops them from getting a nuclear weapon, and that's plenty. No matter what else they do, they won't, they won't have that backed up by, the, the, uh, by a nuclear weapon or the threat that they could soon get a nuclear weapon. So now we have to turn our attention to those other issues and start engaging Iran with the same level of diplomacy and mutual respect that got us this historic achievement. If you read the Saudi press, um, the argument that gets made uh, is that the U.S. is, quote unquote, reconciling yeah. with Iran um, and has chosen Iran over them. Now, these are countries in yeah. that region that have sought and uh, a U.S. protective umbrella mm -hmm. and have they feel, from their perspective, paid, paid dearly for it uh, in terms of domestic opinion, but also in terms of sheer dollars and cents, in terms of the, the relationship they have. They're feeling abandoned. Is that a fair concern on their part, that we've changed 
we change sides in this, uh, in they, this Gulf uh, uh, conflict? I understand that. So they're looking at this as a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. So if Iran gains, therefore they lose. The Israelis, at least the current government's looking at it that way. The Saudis, the Emiratis, that's how they see it. There's a, especially the, 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 the Saudis, there's a fundamental split, and we have just chosen. No, we have not. We have balanced. We have not abandoned Saudi Arabia one bit. We're going to increase our military aid to Israel. We haven't abandoned them one bit. What we've done is we've started to have, we have a different relationship with Iran where we want to bring them in to the security architecture. Why? Because there's a lot of the problems in, in the Middle East we cannot solve without Iran's cooperation. And the truth is we have overlapping strategic objectives. Mm -hmm. We both want to end the war in Syria. We both want to defeat ISIS. We both want to stabilize Afghanistan, stabilize Iraq, and maybe we both want to get a Middle East peace. To do any of those things, you need a Iranian cooperation. You can't do that if you continue to ostracize them and make them your enemy. You also need Saudi cooperation. And the question is, can you create a regional security framework? I think after this initial period of feeling spurned or feeling rebuffed, um, I think the, the Saudis are going to, and the Israelis are going to come around to the new geopolitical realities. Uh, new issue, the ballistic missile tests that Iran uh, engaged in recently, and the U.S. looking for ways to take action. The U.N. would not do uh, a resolution, not give a resolution that would call for new sanctions. The U.S. is talking about doing it alone, adding some new sanctions. Is, is that something we can do? Will it harm the agreement? Um, Will it set us back? It's, a, it's always a risk when we put new sanctions on, but we've now done it twice since we've reached this ag agreement, um, including for c sanctions against some of the cyber activities that mm -hmm. Iran w uh, conducted. We busted or uh, exposed a, a group of Iranian cyber hackers who were attacking U.S. targets and put sanctions on them in particular. The, the missile tests violated existing UN sanctions. They're, they're, we don't approve of these. We don't want them doing this. We don't want anybody in the region testing these, these kinds of missiles. And we put new sanctions on, um, on, on some of the entities involved, the companies involved, the individuals involved. So far, it hasn't negatively impacted the Iran deal. But the truth is that these missile tests are less of a concern to us now because we've stopped the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. These missiles are a danger. If they had nuclear warheads on them, they're not going to have nuclear warheads on them. We don't want the tests going on, but we've taken care of the major part of the threat with the nuclear agreement. Let's go to the Nuclear Security Summit. Uh, President Obama began his administration with incredibly high hopes, yes. as he did in, in several areas. Mm -hmm. um, there's a quote I want to put up on the board if we can, uh, if we can look at it for a second. Um, it, it's something he said recently reflecting back on seven years, and what he said was, uh, of all the threats to global security and peace, the most dangerous is the proliferation of potential use of nuclear weapons. That's why seven years ago in Prague, I committed the United States to stopping the spread of nuclear weapons and seeking a world without them. We've made important progress. We've mm -hmm. taken concrete steps toward a world without nuclear weapons, have we? Yes, we have. They <laughs> are not big enough steps, however, mm -hmm. and there's been some slippage. but. Overall, he presented the most comprehensive, realistic, and ambitious nuclear security agenda anyone has ever brought into the White House. Mm -hmm. And I was proud to serve on his campaign team in 2007, 2008, while he was doing this and helped craft that package. The vision was correct. The steps were correct. He took, he took the three parts of the problem and tackled them individually. Stop terrorists from getting nuclear weapons. That's what this nuclear security summit was all about. Don't let terrorists get their hands on these weapons or these material. Stop new states from getting these weapons. That's what the Iran deal was all about. Incredibly successful there. The major step, step he took, although you can't say he had that, that same kind of success with North Korea, which is still a problem. Reduce nuclear arsenals, remove these as major instruments in international affairs. Less success there. Some agree, one agreement with Russia, but then the Russians balked and haven't been willing to negotiate with us. And here's the key problem, as part of that, on how to balance. He wanted to reduce the weapons, but also make sure that our existing weapons were modernized, made safe and secure. But as the reduction process stopped, the contract process for these new weapons continued. And this now threatens to overwhelm Obama's legacy in an avalanche of new weapons. We're on track to spend a trillion dollars yeah. on new nuclear weapons. 
And, and, and this, this is exactly the opposite of Obama intended. Instead of reducing the role and number of nuclear weapons in U.S. strategy, he's, he may, he's launching us into a potentially dangerous new nuclear arms race. Because if we do this, Russia's going to struggle to keep pace. China's going to keep pace with Russia. India's going to match China. You see the problem that, that, that he might have inadvertently created. He's taking a step back and asking the why question. I remember in 1984 at the Democratic Convention, Jesse Jackson mm. uh, posed an alternative plank, which was no first use, that the U.S. Yeah. pledged no first use. It was defeated. Democrats didn't want to seem weak. But I remember Jesse speaking about it at one point, and he said, there's no first use, there's no second use, there's no use at all. Um, the minute you use it, five minutes later, you're dead. Um, in a world in which we had thousands of nuclear warheads on both sides of the Cold War, um, th there is simply no way to use these weapons That's... without self-destruction. Um, if Iran had a bomb and used it on Israel, Israel would flatten Iran and vice versa. The point is, and at this point in a region like that, everyone would die from the fallout at the end of the day as the winds blew and shifted course. The question is, why do we continue to have these mm -hmm. weapons? Why do people continue to think of them as a useful deterrence when, in fact, they are of no use at all in terms of deterrence? Well, you know, this was true even during the Cold War. Ronald Reagan said, in a nuclear war, we're all losers. Mm -hmm. This is something Donald Trump should un understand. And, and Reagan, in his second inaugural address, pledged to eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. So this goes... This is a bipartisan issue. You don't have to be Jesse Jackson to have this view. So I committing think, to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict is not the only promise that politicians make and don't live up to. They try. You know, so they, they try, and two things are holding them back. And, and one is the general sort of national security norm in Washington, and that, that you, the, the president has to be tough. He can't be seen as giving in. He can't be seen as making concessions. So you can't be seen as reducing nuclear weapons to a lower level than your opponent has, for example. And so, that's a, and so you have this ideological identification of nuclear weapons as, as strength. That is faded somewhat with the Cold War. Most people don't even think about nuclear weapons much anymore. And I think what's propelling it right now is really the people who still have a vested interest in the weapons, in the bases, in the billets, the, what I call the nuclear industrial complex. So the, 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 the few states that still have ICBM bases, like, like, uh, like Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Utah, they defend these, these bases and don't want to lose the jobs associated with them. The contractors, like General Dynamics, who make nuclear submarines in, in New England, defend those contracts and they get their politicians to support them. So you have to have a president who's willing to overcome some of that, a push back against that, co that complex. And if you're not, if you're doing something else, like the president's been doing for the last few years, that complex j has enough strength to push the contracts through and, l and lock those weapons in place. And that's the situation we're facing right now. In the next two or three years, we're going to face contract decisions that could lock us in to n a new generation of nuclear weapons for the next 50 years. And this next gen uh, of nuclear weapons is, has a, a trillion dollar price tag. A trillion dollar price tag, new bombers, new subs, new missiles, new, new, new warheads for the missiles, new complexes to build the warheads. We, we have 1,700 plus warheads now. Uh, strategic long-range on alert warheads, and there's and, many more in reserve. And Russia has 19, about the same, uh, yeah, 1, roughly the same. We, we well, roughly have about five thousand each. Where in our are they? What arsenal. do they do? And uh, why do you need more? <laughs> you don't even need these. We're, yeah. Russia and the, and the U.S. have ninety-five percent of the world's arsenals. We're the only states that count our weapons in, by the thousands. Everybody else has counts them by the dozens. So they have a, f a few hundred each. France, China, Great Britain, India, Pakistan, 100 each. Israel, about 80. North Korea, enough per for perhaps uh, 10 weapons. And, you know, China is an interesting example. China has about 200 weapons, and they consider that plenty. That is their deterrent. That is enough to stop somebody with 10 times that amount 
from, from attacking them. We, we have, well, 5,000 in our active arsenal. China has about 200. We wouldn't for a minute think about attacking China with a nuclear weapon because you know what would happen next. Just what you say, they would attack us. And taking out one city, two cities, three cities is enough to deter us. The reason we have so much is just the, the persistence of the Cold War thinking, a, a kind of thinking President Obama hoped to end, pledged to end, has not ended. Uh, the danger is not so much states using them, uh -huh. but non-state actors, and that's what yeah. this summit was about. What, how does one go about um, dealing with this issue mm. uh, when we haven't been able to stop non-state actors from getting AK-47s or whatever other weapon of choice they have to commit the atrocities that we see committed by a range of extremist groups. Yeah. Well, f <coughs> fortunately, terrorists have been satisfied to, to do their damage with truck bombs or plane bombs or machetes mm -hmm. and haven't felt the need to go to mass destruction. But this has been a concern from the beginning of the nuclear age. When Robert Oppenheimer, the head of the Manhattan Project, was testifying before the Senate in 46, they asked him if nuclear terrorism was a threat. He said, yes, of course. And he said, what do we, they asked him, what do we need to stop it? And he said, a screwdriver, because you have to, have to open up every crate that would come into the United States to make sure a bomb wasn't being smuggled in. So we've been worried about this for some time. And the answer for the Nuclear Security Summit is the right answer. They can't, a terrorist group can't build the bomb by themselves. This takes a, a factory with gigawatts of energy and billions of dollars in investment. It's a state enterprise. But if they can get the material, uh, highly enriched uranium, maybe 25 kilograms, about the amount you'd put in a, 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 a package the size of a sugar bag, if they can get that, a well-organized group like ISIS or Al-Qaeda can probably construct a Hiroshima-type device. It's no trouble to smuggle it into the United States. Getting it into the port is good enough, and there's no shortage of suicide bombers. So the, even though the, ch the, the chance of them doing that is, is low, it's not zero, mm -hmm. and the consequences are enormous. So that's why you got 50 world leaders devoting their energy to this. And now we're increasingly worried about the so-called dirty bomb not an explosive bomb, but taking a conventional truck bomb and lacing it with radioactive material. And the news that the Brussels bombers, the people who blew up the mm -hmm, airport mm -hmm. and the metro center, were videotaping a Belgian nuclear official who worked at a facility where they had these kinds of radiological materials. Has that material all been spine. sewn up? Has, no, not at all. That's the problem. Yeah. Enough of this stuff has got dozens of industrial uses. It's used in hospitals and, and, okay. and mining and, and commercial enterprises, and it's loosely guarded. And unless we start guiding this, guarding this stuff a lot better than we are now, I think a dirty bomb attack is almost inevitable. At the last summit, the um, Egyptians mm. raised an issue which they have raised several times at the UN and elsewhere, and that is to have a Middle East nuclear free zone um, as the way to deal with the Iran issue. But that also then raises the issue of Israel, yes. and the U.S. therefore uh, blocked the Egyptian proposal. Um, wh one of the questions I have when, when this was a call-in format and we were, hmm. uh, we were live in the Middle East, I would get, no matter when we talked about nuclear weapons or Iran, immediately you'd get phone calls from people mm -hmm. everywhere across the Arab world saying, but what about Israel? The double standard yes. issue is one that impedes uh, clear thinking on how to deal with this question. They, 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 it doesn't make sense to them because it just doesn't make sense. I mean, how we turn a blind eye to a country that doesn't sign the non-proliferation treaty, that has nuclear weapons, that doesn't allow inspections, um, and yet is damning everybody else in the region for uh, its nuclear aspirations doesn't make sense to people. Because, it, it, like I said, it just doesn't make sense. It, it, it is indefensible strategically. <clears throat> it doesn't make good strategic sense. The only way to understand this is to look at American domestic politics and, and understand the influence. But why should other countries have to defer to that? They shouldn't. That's the issue. <laughs> Not, no, you're asking me what drives the yeah. policy. Yeah. It's domestic politics yeah. that drives this. It's not an objective, strategic sense. Oh, yeah. it's good that Israel has nuclear weapons in the Middle East and no 
nobody else does. No, that is not a good thing. That is, that is an anomaly. There's no other region of the world where there's one nuclear power. Either there's none, the Southern Hemisphere, Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, no nuclear weapons, or there's multiple uh, nuclear yeah. states. So that, that situation with Israel can't last. I, I believe that it's in Israel's national security interest to get rid of their nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. to take them out of the basement and put them on the table. I think eventually we'll see that, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a ways off. Because when we lecture others about it and turn a blind eye to that, it kind of reminds me of maybe a situation of Hugh Hefner conducting marriage encounter classes. You know, it just, it, 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 it doesn't pass the smell yeah, test. Or, or, or being a chain smoker and telling other people not to smoke. Yeah. I mean, it, it can't hold, it I can't like work. I like my metaphor, a little, <laughs> little more colorful. Okay. Let, let's, uh, um, let's go to the, uh, the non-proliferation treaty. A yeah. question I always had about that was that, I take advantage of you being here now to ask you about it. We signed it. Yes. But the Senate didn't approve it. No, you're talking about the comprehensive the test, compre ban treaty. test ban treaty. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. What does it mean yeah. that the Senate hasn't approved it? Is it binding still or uh, not? This is a very interesting question. So this is a, a Clinton legacy. Bill Clinton finally negotiated this thing in 1996. Mm -hmm. It was a U.S.-led initiative. We wanted it. We did conducted more tests than everybody else combined, 1,000 tests. We, our weapons work. We're not worried about them. So we want to stop other people from... from from getting them. It's, that's why it's a non-proliferation measure. It's hard for another country to get nuclear weapons without testing them, so let's stop them from testing. We signed it, we negotiated it, but then the U.S. Senate rejected it largely for political reasons. In 1999, they had just failed to impeach the president. They weren't about to give him a, uh, a national security victory. They, bl they blocked it. Clinton could have done a better job. He didn't. There's some hope that the next president, if it's a Democrat, could bring this back up now. Because it's still in our national security interests. We want this to be a barrier to other countries getting nuclear weapons. We want it to be a barrier to countries that have them from building new ones, improved ones, having more confidence. Uh, it's it's the it's was what they call the longest fought, uh, hard, hardest sought for goal in arms control history, it still hasn't been completed. We have just a couple of minutes left, but I want to ask you about North Korea. Yes. Uh, testing again. Yes. And testing in many ways, testing uh, both ballistic missiles and also yes. uh, nuclear weapons. The question is, we engage China on this question. What is China doing? Are they doing enough? And, um, and what can they do the bad to news provide, provide some restraint? The bad news about North Korea is that it's an unstable government and a, 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 an erratic leader with enough material for maybe 10 weapons, and they're, and they're building more of them and trying to build long-range missiles. The good news is we don't think they've actually successfully miniaturized a warhead yet to put on a missile, and we don't think they have a missile that can hit the United States, but they do have missiles that can hit Japan and North Korea, so you're worried about it. Is China doing enough? No, but they're doing more because they don't have confidence in this leader either. They have a much different relationship with Kim Jong-un than they did with his father, Kim Jong-il. Jong and, and so they're, they're cracking down more. They, they've agreed to the harshest sanctions yet on North Korea. They, they, they would like us to negotiate directly with North Korea. We've been hesitant to do that. I think that's a mistake. Clearly, our policy has failed. We've tried to ignore them. We've tried to hope that they will go away, but like the Glenn Close character in Fatal Attraction, they will not be ignored. If you don't talk with them, they test. If you don't talk with them, they shoot off missiles. The only way to stop it is to try to adapt the Iran model to North Korea. Engage them with the sanctions, with the pressures, with international par partners, and try to freeze their program. Then let's see if we can walk it back. Thank you, Joseph Rincioni. Fascinating discussion. Well, that's all the time we've got. For more information, you can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA or on the web at AAIUSA.org. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint.